lot done during meetings, boring meetings. We hope it's not too boring, but anyway. born in Cass Medical Center, one of the very few that was before they shut that down, uh, the, the labor and delivery there. But proud to be from Harrisonville, proud to make it back home. I uh, enjoy getting back here as much as possible, but I unfortunately have to live out in Washington, D.C. now to do my current job. But we've been going all around the 4th District the past few days and having a great time talking to people, learning from them what is on their minds, some of the things that they're concerned about. Uh, have questions about so that's what we're here for again tonight vicky's really excited to meet all of you and talk to you all uh, about those things that you have concerns with so she's going to first of all tell you some of the things she's been working on about 10-15 minutes of that and then open it up to questions and hear uh, what you all have to say so i'd like to introduce congresswoman vicky hartson You think it's necessary? Yes. It is necessary. Okay, we will we will do this. But uh, thank you, Eric. And I, many of you know Eric. And I can just tell you, he is doing such a wonderful job. He is such a, a wonderful blessing to all of us uh, in, in D.C. And now he's my chief of staff. And I uh, couldn't be more proud of him. His mom's Carol's here. And many of you know her. But um, I just would like for you to give him a round of applause for Eric. Uh, I work for you and they work for you and we are we're here to serve you and um, we have a great team and um, just so thankful for each and every one of them and I appreciate State Representative Scott Largent being here. He's doing a great job representing Cass County and some other parts of the county uh, down in Jefferson City. So thank you for coming Scott. appreciate uh, all you're doing there. But most of all, I want to thank you for coming. Now, it is a gorgeous day out there, which I'm sure you know. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could be doing uh, besides, you know, being here. But I think it shows uh, how you care about this country and that you would take time to come here and, and spend a little time visiting with me. And uh, actually, I want to do listening. I want to listen as much as I want to talk uh, today. I've got just a few things we want to share. Uh, some slides I thought you might find interesting. There's some things going on in Washington. But mainly, I want to listen to you, hear what's on your mind, get your thoughts and your perspective, because I believe Washington needs more of your common sense ideas and needs our heartland values. So that's what we are trying to, trying to do, is to take your thoughts, your ideas, your values to D.C. and try to uh, change and improve our country. Uh, I feel very honored to have been there over a, a little over a year now, and um, we've had just a, a wonderful opportunity to work for you not only on the House uh, Agriculture Committee, but I'm also on the Armed Services Committee, and uh, would love to answer any questions about what we've been doing on these committees. But as far as the slides go, we put this one on first, and several of you mentioned uh, you'd rather depressing, so I'm sorry I didn't want to, uh, to discourage you, but this does show the depth of, of some of the issues that we are facing in Washington, and one of it is the runaway spending that we have. We're borrowing between four and six billion dollars a day just to keep the government going with all the programs that have been approved. And that's why we are at uh, where we are at right now, over $15 trillion in debt as a nation. And so that is one of the hot topics that we are discussing. First and foremost is uh, the uh, federal, oh, thank you. Here we go, we have this. Um, it is the federal overspending, yes. Um, like I said, we are spending a lot of money that we actually don't have. We are borrowing 
about 36 cents on the dollar now. Um, every, for every dollar we spend, uh, 36 cents of it is borrowed. And you know, at home, you couldn't keep doing that. Our debt, this $15 trillion debt, equals now our GDP. So the value of our goods and services equals the amount of uh, money that we owe. And that'd be like you uh, and I, if we had a credit card bill that equaled our yearly salary. And that would be bad. <laughs> and that's where we're at as a nation. It's unsustainable and you can go bankrupt as a country if you continue down this path. So we're trying to reverse that. And well, the way we are doing that uh, is looking at the budget, uh, looking for ways to cut, and then looking for ways to increase income. And we'll talk about that in a second. I shared this last year. I know some of you were here last year. Thank you for coming back in labor, health and human services, uh, on and on. All the departments, Congress, foreign aid, all of that is in the red category. Then we have defense. Those two categories alone is, makes up most of what Congress votes on and debates. And when you're talking about, when we're trying to cut or find efficiencies in government, we're mainly talking about those two areas there because the rest of the budget is just set on automatic spending, automatic uh, autopilot. These are programs that Congresses in the past have approved and they just run automatically whether Congress votes for them every year or not. They're not needed for, to vote on. So of course, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, net interest, and other mandatory. Um, other mandatory, they just lumped a bunch of other programs where Congress has passed that if uh, somebody meets certain criteria, then they're uh, uh, given so much money for various reasons. So other mandatory would include things like Pell Grants, uh, uh, farm subsidies, unemployment benefits, welfare programs, uh, those type of programs. The net interest, I wanted to point out, because that's something I'm keeping my eye on, are interest rates overall high or low right now? They're low, right. And you can see how much of the budget is being eaten up just on our interest payments now. So if the interest rates go up, that could be very concerning because that means it'll eat up a larger percentage of our budget which will squeeze out the money for other categories. So we're going to have to keep our eye on the, uh, the interest on the debt category here. Now this is the same bar uh, uh, pie chart put in a bar graph form and I asked my staff to do this because I wanted to be able to share with you uh, the revenue side and so you can compare. Uh, these are the same categories, different colors, but Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, other mandatory, national defense, other discretionary and net interest. This is how much money came in uh, the same year. This is 2010. So you see how much came in for Social Security. Oh, that helps. That's nice. Social Security and uh, how much went out. Can you see which one is bigger, the in or the out? Yeah, yeah. Last year, we passed a threshold in our country, which was pretty significant. For the first year, there was more money going out of Social Security than coming in. And so the Social Security trustees are starting to call in their IOUs from the government, uh, from the excess funds that have been invested over the years, and the general revenue is, is paying that back. Uh, then we have Medicare, uh, how much came in, and you see how much that went out there. Of course, obviously, Medicare is a very, very important program uh, for seniors, and a lot of people rely on it. So we have to be very careful what we do there. The, the, the concern is that the average American couple pays in about $110,000 a year, I mean, not a year, over their lifetime. The average American couple, though, is receiving about $330,000 worth of Medicare benefits. So you can see that's part of the uh, shortfall that we're running into uh, with Medicare and, uh, and with our whole budget situation. Okay, here's income tax. Of course, April 15th is just around the corner. We can, you know, it's not very much fun, but this is how much money came in from individual income taxes. We have corporate taxes, other, and excise taxes. So you can see there's a problem. There's not enough money that came in that went out uh, and that's something I wanted to point out. Uh, we need to redo this slide, but if we took the net interest and put it right here, 
I wanted to, you to see that to balance the budget, we could cut all of other discretionary numbers, all of Washington. We could just shut it down, everything. Usually there's round of applause. In there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we could uh, shut all of Washington down as well as cut all of our national defense, and it still would not balance the budget. So just to show you the depth of what we're talking about, I've heard a lot of great suggestions from people all in the 4th District about how we can get to balance budget. Uh, people have said, well, we need to just cut all the foreign aid, or we need to uh, eliminate the Department of Education, or Department of Energy, or whatever, or we need to shut down Congress. Usually around the boss <laughs> right? uh, A lot of, lot of suggestions, but the, just so you know, not that those aren't things maybe we could look at, um, but even if you cut it all out, we still would balance. So we didn't get here overnight, uh, but we're probably not going to get out of this overnight. And this is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, I know we have Democrats here in the crowd, and we have Republicans, and we have Independents. Uh, there have been Congresses for years, Republican Congresses, Democrat Congresses. We've had Republican Presidents, Democrat Presidents, and they all have spent too much. You know, so that's why we are where we're at. But we just need to not put blame and decide what we're going to do going forward and what we want to do for our kids and our grandkids. And so this is where we're at, and this is uh, the challenges we're dealing with. This is how much we had to borrow, you see, just to make uh, keep our government going in total, which averages out about four to six billion dollars a day. That's what you see on the debt clock going continually. Uh, of the borrowed amount of money that we have. Approximately 47%, 49%, somewhere around there, is uh, owed to foreign countries. Foreign countries are buying our debt. And of the foreign debt, 29% of it is owned by China. So this is concerning to me. Um, being on Armed Services Committee, we're watching a lot of dangers around the world. There's certainly Iran has a lot of concerns. Certainly there's... Uh, North Korea. But China is something that's concern, concerning as well. And uh, I think one reason that we need to try to pay off our debt and get to a balanced budget is because of uh, the how we're beholden to this country, to China. For instance, uh, with the interest we pay to China on our debt, China can afford to buy three new joint strike fighters every week with $50 million a week left over. So that's pretty sobering. Now, I'm not saying they're doing this exactly, but we do know they're building up their military, and um, so they're no doubt using some of that money that we're helping send over there with interest to do it. Uh, this is, yeah, so what's the solution? Well, I think we need to get to a balanced budget. Real common sense from Cass County, we're trying to take to Washington. I mean, you and I, we balance our budgets at home, on our farms, and our, around our kitchen tables. Washington needs to, too. So we've tried a couple of things to balance budget. One, we've supported passing a balanced budget amendment. Uh, 49 states have some sort of a balanced budget amendment to their state constitution. Yet Washington does it. And some people in Washington say, well, we don't need a balanced budget amendment. We can have the self-control to balance it ourselves. Well, I think they can see that's not the case. They need a little help. So we put forth a balanced budget amendment. I co-sponsored it. And as you may remember from your eighth grade uh, social studies class, to pass an amendment to the Constitution, you have to pass it with two-thirds support in both the House and the Senate. And then it goes out to the states to be ratified, and three-fourths of the states have to ratify it. So we voted in the House on it, and we came about five votes shy of having the two-thirds that we needed. So we didn't quite, weren't able to get it done, uh, but it's going to come back. We're going to keep pushing that because I think it makes sense to force Washington to live within its means. But the second thing that we've done is to try to just on our own put forth a budget that's going to balance. And so here's the uh, history of some of the spending in our country. You can see where it's gone. Uh, but here's where it's going to go if we don't do something. The projections are it's going to go off the chart, and that's not good. Obviously, it'll probably bankrupt our country when we don't do something. This is what the President's budget does. It never balances. Uh, we voted on the President's budget last week, no, two weeks ago, 
two weeks ago in the House, it didn't receive one vote. I, I was amazed. Nobody voted for it. <clears throat> Republicans, Democrats, nobody voted for the President's budget. And I think this is the reason, because people know that it's just going to be unsustainable. So in the House, we put forth a budget that gets us to balance, um, and, but it takes a few years. There was a, uh, I did support it, it did pass. There was another version, the blue line, that was put out a little more aggressive, and I supported that. It didn't have enough votes to pass, but it would have balanced in five years. So I think the sooner we get to balance budget and start paying off this debt, the better we are. But we're gonna keep working on that. But the other way to balance budget is to get more people back to work, increase revenues. You know, I used to teach home economics and personal family finance, and some of you like to know that. Uh, but I would teach my high school kids how to balance and say, okay, your, your income, your expenses can't be more than your income. And they would get it. And I just don't see why Washington doesn't get it. Uh, they understand that. But if we talk about if you're running a little short, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, you can cut your expenses, quit running around town as much with their, your gas or whatever. Or you can pick up another job, get a second income, and make a little more income. They got it. So that's where we are as a nation. We're out of balance, so we need to either cut our expenses or raise our income. Now, there's two ways to raise income, or more than two, or combination, but a lot of, we're talking about this a lot in Washington. Uh, some people think we need to raise taxes as the way to raise income. I don't support that. Uh, what I prefer is to try to get more people working. We've had over 36 months now of over 8% unemployment, and that means a lot of hurting people that are looking for work. Um, and that means there, there's not as much tax revenue coming in, plus there's more expenses. They're using more government services. One in seven Americans now is on food stamps. It's the most in our history as a country. I think that's tragic. It's unacceptable. So we need to do everything we can to help create jobs. Uh, there's two different ways of thinking on the creating jobs, too. One side prefers to borrow more money and have the government try to create jobs through stimulus spending. Um, I don't think that's good. That's not wise for us to indebt ourselves further. Plus, the government doesn't create jobs. It's the private sector that creates those long sustaining jobs on the whole. So I talked to a lot of business owners and asked them in the 4th District, why aren't you hiring? What can you do to get more people back to work? And what they tell me is the reason they're not hiring, it's not that many of them don't have the capital, it's because of the uncertainty in the economic climate that they don't know the largest tax increase in America's history that's due to go into effect January 1. So, and I don't know what my health care costs are going to be with the government take over of health care. The premiums are skyrocketing. So I don't know what regulations we're going to have because of all the different government agencies that are coming in and, and making demands and putting, you know, making our life miserable. I don't know if I'm going to be able to access credit because of the Dodd-Frank bill that's hurting our community banks. Uh, they said, so until all this is figured out, I'm not going to build a, a second store or open up a new location or expand or hire more workers. So what I'm trying to do is remove those barriers. Uh, oh, plus they don't know their energy costs. I was going to add that. That comes up a lot. So these are some examples of some of the bills we passed in the House to remove some of those barriers, whether it be to energy, whether it be to push back on some of the regulations, make sure they access capital. Uh, these are some of the ones that have passed. The frustrating thing is, most of them, 28 of the 30 we passed, are just sitting in the Senate. And I have to admit that's been one of the most frustrating parts of what I've been trying to do for you guys, is to get our economy going again. We do all these things, and then they just sit, and Harry Reid says, we're not going to vote on it. So that's the reality of where we're at. But we're going to keep fighting, we're going to keep trying to, to get these things through, because it's the right thing to do, and we want to help people get back to work. I've been trying to do some practical things to get people back to work too. We had a business conference, small business conference in Warrensburg. Had over 300 people come, and these were entrepreneurs and small business owners. And um, we had different panels on different topics, like how to grow your business, how to market your business, how to, how to access uh, finance for your business. 
and it was it was really positive. Then uh, a few weeks ago, down in Lebanon, we had our first jobs fair, and I never had one before, but I, it was really uh, great. We had over 29 companies come in from around the south part of our district. They set up tables, and we invited job seekers to come in. And you may know people in Lebanon, but Laclede County, that area, has about 14% unemployment. Um, anyway, we had over 100 people come who were looking for work, and they went around and visited, and we checked with all the job uh, creators and companies and asked them, if you could hire today, if you met the right person here, how many people would you hire? And collectively, there was 223 jobs available, which that encouraged me, first of all, that there's that many companies that were wanting to hire and looking for good people. Um, anyway, long story short, later that day, at the end of the day, we found out that many people did get hired that day. So I was really happy about that, and I uh, hope we can continue to do more to help people find work. The last topic, hot topic, is gas prices. <laughs> that was Eric, Eric held that. I thought that was hilarious. It's, that's not the truth. Gas prices, it seems like it's an arm or leg or your first floor, it's very expensive. Um, but what can we do? I want to do everything we can to, to get our gas prices down. They've just been going up and up and up. Of course, you know, you know, in January 2009, it was $1.89, and it's more than double. Uh, Missouri's current gas average is about $374, so that's, that's tough. That is tough. So what, what uh, goes into gas prices? What can we do? Well, you guys probably know it's a global market, um, and that complicates issues. Especially when you have Iran threatening to shut down the Strait of Hormuz over there, causing the uncertainty on the supply, uh, causing the prices to go up. But I think a lot of it is because we are so vulnerable ourselves that we're dependent on Middle Eastern oil. So when something happens over in the Middle East, you know, we're susceptible to having the prices go up because there's a threat of having our supply cut off. So I've been trying to promote using more of the energy that resources that America has been blessed with. We are the Saudi Arabia of the world in coal. Uh, it's clean, it's affordable, it's accessible. You guys should probably know that 85% of Missouri's electricity is generated from coal. So we you know, support coal here, we need to be using it. We're the, also the Saudi Arabia of the world in natural gas. It's clean, it's affordable, it's available, let's use it. And we have plenty of oil reserves in this country that we can, should tap into and should use. Uh, I have a friend yesterday who came uh, to church, had seen her a few years, they moved uh, several years ago, but her husband is building homes up in, on the Montana, North Dakota border. And she was telling me some firsthand stories that validated other stories I've heard about what's going on there. Have you guys heard about this? Up in North Dakota, it's like the, the gold rush day. She said, literally, it really, really is. People are living in tents, uh, coming there to work from all over the country. They can't hardly find enough workers. Uh, the town that she's in has 10,000 people, or that he's in, 10,000 people. They expect in two years it to double to 20,000 people because they found a way to tap into the Balkan uh, oil reserve there, and they're just pumping as much oil as they can. And there's other places in the country like that where we could be accessing that'll create jobs that are needed, plus it'll help us become more energy independent so we're not so dependent on uh, foreign oil. So uh, the Keystone Pipeline uh, a project that I supported, we've been trying to encourage the president to come on board and support it. Uh, he hasn't yet, but it's 20,000 jobs, they say, most of labor union jobs created right there. So we need to move forward with that. Uh, I supported all the above energy policy besides the things I mentioned. I think we should be doing more nuclear as well. Uh, France is almost totally uh, energized through nuclear energy and we could be doing that. But it takes about 15 years to build a new nuclear plant. So we need to move forward with the permits, make sure it's safe, but we could be doing that too. As well as renewables and, and other solutions. So let's become energy independent. I'm going to keep working towards that and promoting that idea because I think it makes sense. Oh, so that's my uh, summary there of some of the hot topics that I know is probably on your mind. But I wanted to uh, open it up and see what's on your mind and hear your questions and your comments and uh, 
hear your wisdom that I can uh, take back with me. So, yes. Well, you were just talking about gas prices, and it seems like the uh, gas companies are making record profits, mm -hmm. and, and Congress keeps giving them more and more tax breaks and some of uh, What is the big oil companies um, give lots of money, I know, to Congress? What are the, when are we going to feel the, the relief yeah. from the tax breaks, from the gas prices? Yeah, that's one of the first things I looked at when I went to Washington because I heard everybody talking about all these oil subsidies and things. And so I asked my staff to research and give me some information on what exactly are all the oil subsidies. And it's very interesting. There's, there's all kinds of different categories there. Uh, a few of them are directly related to them specifically, such as a tax credit if, if they drill in a hard-to-drill new area. Uh, then they're given a tax credit for that. But a lot of the tax credits, or what people call subsidies, aren't specific for them. They're available to all manufacturing in America, such as depreciating new equipment and things. So there's a little bit of a distortion when people talk about all oh, these oil subsidies, when really there's only a few specifics. But I can tell you, uh, we are, I, I'm willing to look at that and, and do away with some of those if it makes sense. As far as you know, taxing them, I, I've thought about that, and what I think is just, I'm trying to think, how are we going to reduce the price of the pub? So I'm just thinking, for, if we tax the oil companies more, is that going to reduce the price of the pub? I don't really think so. So I'm is not sure that's the right, you took from sure the big oil the right companies going to reduce the price so, of the pub? If you hold your hand up, I'll call on you. Maybe. <laughs> You're a stay up friendly here. Okay, who's next? Here we go. You're, Same call follow up. Later, Mike. 37K. About Bakken. Uh, are you aware of the fact that when they get a lot of oil that they're hauling by rail to Oklahoma, that they shut the train down because it starts getting to be 50 to $50 a barrel less when they have a glut in Oklahoma because they'd rather sell it on the coast? Nope. Got to check into it. Okay. The train stopped. And I have several friends who work with Zara. Ah. Wow. Um, Very interesting. Well, I certainly don't uh, uh, claim to be an expert on that. So. just stop. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes, I have a question. <clears throat> I'm on Social Security and Medicare, and I'm a Navy veteran. And your support for Paul Ryan's budget yeah. is in conflict, it seems to me, with your desire to control spending. It, 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 it does control my spending because it can double the cost of my Medicare. It gives tax breaks to the wealthiest people in the country, which I can't imagine that they need. And in fact, he gave in this budget more money to the Pentagon than they requested. When, they were, when he was asked about it, he said that he didn't believe the generals were telling the truth. And I wonder if anybody's ever seen a time where a general or an admiral ever asked for any less than he really wanted. Never. Well, you've got a lot in there. Boy, you Thank just you. unloaded there. <laughs> yeah. Feel better, I'm sure. But uh, first, let's start with Social Security. Uh, the uh, Ryan plan mainly is asking the Social Security trustees to come up with a plan in, in that regard. It, it's very easy to fix, um, and it should be should be addressed because it's a very, very vital program for seniors and many people depend on it. Um, as far as the other categories that you, you talked about, I would like to hear from the President or from the Democrats their plan to get us to a balanced budget and to save our country. So far, all we've heard is demonization of our attempt to lead this country and to get us to a balanced budget, but yet you haven't put forth with a solution of your own. So when you all come up with a solution for how to save, protect, and preserve Medicare, I'm more than happy to listen to it, as well as to how to balance the budget, because I want to make sure that our country is safe for our children and grandchildren. Come on, you control Congress. You took from big oil for your campaign. Is that help with gas prices? The press is reporting it everywhere today. I just heard that, Don, today, and, and that's, uh, that was news to me, and if it's, uh, I'm sure if it's true, it's true, but I don't base my so decisions don't know? on that. I haven't kept track of all of the individual things, Don, uh, but your insinuation I resent. And that is I that, resent a lot of well, things you do too, huh? I know, I know. <laughs> but Don, you're insinuating that I'm basing my decisions on that. That's absolutely false. I base my decisions on what's best for this country and for the people of this district. So I want you to know that. Yes. 
sir. It seemed like in Social Security they could raise the amount that they deduct from people that you know, it stops at a certain point. Yep. I realize it's gone up over the period of years, but it seemed like they could just raise that up and still fix Social Security. Exactly. That is something that uh, should be talked about by the Social Security trustees. It's an idea that is actually a lot of people in the district have talked about. It's, it's a good solution. It makes sense to me. And so um, hopefully they will come up with that. We just want to be proactive because they say that in 2027 we're going to run out of the IOUs and I know we can keep kicking the can down the road and that's what the president wants to do, that's what the Harry Reid's party wants to do and they haven't put forth any solutions to protect and preserve Medicare or Social Security. I care about everybody who is uh, elderly and it depends on Social Security and that's why I think it's time that we care enough about them to quit kicking the can down the road and to come up with solutions and not demonize it for political purposes. Yes, sir. Our Social Security, I owe you. We never hear the amount of money that our government has stuck out of Social Security. Can you do anything about getting that money up where people will know how many billions of dollars that the government just took out of Social Security? Well, yes, we're happy to look into to what you're saying, though. But I, from my understanding, visiting with people on the issue, is that it's kind of been like a CD. Uh, more money has been coming in to Social Security than has been needed, than has been going out. And so the trustees have taken the extra, just like you had extra at home and wanted to invest it in a CD. Uh, they have invested it in the country uh, with T-bills and, and the bonds, and they've been getting interest on that. Now, you can look at it from the other side and say, well, the government's been using their money. Well, yes, but they threw government T-bonds and bills, and they're paid it back. So people tell me there's actually a file cabinet in Washington, D.C. that has these IOUs, these uh, CDs, if you will, that the Social Security uh, has been investing in, in the government, and that's what they're starting to cash in on now, is to, uh, you know, send those back and they're getting them cash back. Uh, so the money is, is there, it's been invested, but it's, it's going to be used uh, for Social Security, and it, as rightly it should be, because that's very, very important. Yes? Uh, what is the job? I mean, I've heard that so many jobs have been lost, so many jobs have been created. And I've Googled online, and I can't really find anything that tells me what a job is. I mean, is it, is it you know, a, a six-week uh, employment? Is it a, a year employment? Uh, I hear all these, these numbers about how many jobs they want to create. And I don't find any definition of what a job is. <laughs> I, I just know that there's a million less people working today than uh, four years ago or three years ago when uh, President Obama took office. And, and that's not, not acceptable. Uh, we need to get people working again. And uh, you can go on the census and it'll list different kinds of jobs and things in the Department of Labor, but I don't know if there's a definition or not. I haven't looked for that. You were talking about, uh, about your job, Mayor uh, uh, I would I would suggest that, that we promote businesses that help fast track the growth of other businesses. That way we would have people with with the uh, startup and rural uh, abilities uh, would help other people that are, you know, that are lay people and, and find it difficult to negotiate all the regulations and everything. And it seems like something like that would sort of be in itself. We have a whole kind of industry of uh, startup uh, businesses uh, creating a whole, whole raft of, uh, of other businesses depending on, on what the inclination is. It just seems like a sort of self-supporting uh, system. Sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate the good ideas. Any Anything you have to help people get back to work, we certainly want to hear. But uh, uh, I worked for at and 25 years ago, and I was laid off at 18 years because you see uh, our jobs are in other countries. Why can't we get some kind of incentive that they're bringing jobs back here? There are people back to work. Put a tax on these big companies that's going over there and giving our jobs to these other people. And uh, they were all ready to get in there and work. I've seen people 
people come to work sick because they have this job. You work, you are proud of your job. That's fun at the women. People don't care anymore. Why? That's great. I think that's something Barnett's you know, something we can all agree on. So that's good. That's good. You know, I, I we do need to get more jobs companies to come back here. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look and figure out why are they going over there? Why are they leaving? And so um, some of, one of the reasons is we have is taxation. We now have, as of last a week ago Sunday, the highest tax rate in the world, corporate tax rate. Um, and that Japan was number one. We were number two. Japan had enough foresight to lower theirs to make them more competitive. So now we're up here as the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Uh, that's why I support a bill, including the budget that we passed, that would reduce the highest corporate, the, the highest rate to 25%, encourage people to come back. Second reason, another reason, is the regulations. The excessive regulations, a certain amount of regulations is, you know, is needed, but excessive? No. Uh, so we need to pull them back. And uh, just those two things alone would encourage people to, to come back, and that's what we need to focus on. You're absolutely right, so thank you. We're talking about regulations, that's one thing, but um, listen, no one's in saying we need to raise taxes. But when you hear of corporate managers getting $42 million a year bonus, you're frowning at that. But what do you do? No, I mean, and these people are, what about Hallmark, who sent their, was it regulations that caused Hallmark to send their production to China? Were they not making enough money? What about it? All the businesses that have gone overseas, was it regulations? I don't think so. You should know that. You're shrugging your shoulders. We're asking you these questions. You say you have the answers. No, I didn't say I had the answers, but I said I believe we but can get a solutions here. Washington now? But I haven't visited personally with Hallmark uh, Company to specifically hear their example or some of these other specific companies. But I have visited with enough people to know in general uh, some of the problems. Like One of what? The, I just said, the corporate tax rate. What regulations are you talking about? Well, uh, let's take the EPA and, um, and energy. How they're making life miserable for our electric companies and our, our power plants here. Last week, they came out with another regulation that would say basically uh, there would be no more coal power power plants in this country because any new power plant would have to have this very expensive technology on it, which isn't even uh, completed yet. It's still in experimental stages. And they even said that the purpose, well, we know nobody can comply, but that's because we don't want any coal power plants anymore. Then they say they're going to look at applying that to our current power plants. Uh, so that is very, very concerning. It's increasing our energy prices here in America, and it doesn't have to be that way. So there's clothing? some over, over regulations example. Okay, so. regulations for clothing, for shoes, for machinery. Mm -hmm. Stuff cleaning. Yeah. There's a lot of I things. Guess yeah. just I, I have a two-part question, and I'll ask it, and then I'll let you answer both of them if you'll give me the opportunity to do that. Number one, um, under the Bush administration, we had a disastrous, uh, uh, terrible bridge collapse. I can't remember the year, but it was President Bush was uh, the president then. And at that time, he immediately put into force the um, regulation to find out where we are in the world with, the, with, our, with our bridges. And at the report end, and I think you've got enough staff here that I can always dig up all the information. I, don't, I can't fill in the blanks on but there were over 900 immediately that needed help in the bridges before they had another terrible collapse. That has never been done, and to me, there's your answer right there for your jobs. You wouldn't have to get any corporate America to worry about anything, any, whatever, because we know how to build things here. We know how to build highways and bridges and roads, and that in itself right there would help us with our tax base because those people would go back to work, they would pay the taxes, these people that are afraid of what's going to happen on their businesses would say, hey, you know what? I got people that have money to buy something now. That's the first thing. So I hope you'll be looking at that on the bridge situation and us being able to put those people to work. The second one is um, we're talking about the foreign uh, trade. The tax is so unfair about the imports that are coming in. That's something you could do something about. You could start on that one immediately because I'll bet you if you checked uh, the retirement status of these people in here, 
A lot of them probably had good jobs and got retirement benefits. I myself worked at Western Electric up in Lee Summit. My dad lived here in Harrisonville all his, all his life. He worked at the gas service company. Well, they, we don't have those jobs like that anymore. So we need to tax all those, those products that are coming in that they're selling over here at the Walmart store so that they won't have, the, the, they'll have something fair. We have nothing fair when it comes to imports. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Claire. I appreciate uh, your comments and, and excellent points. Let's start with the bridges. Yep. Um, I, I, I support transportation, uh, us spending our tax dollars on transportation. It makes sense. I think the government should do what people can't do for themselves, and I can't even, I can't go out and build a highway uh, or build a bridge. But collectively, that's a legitimate use of our tax dollars. Uh, Congress has been uh, debating the renewal of the Surface Transportation Act. And that's very, very important. It's set to expire. It was set to expire mid March, and we extended it. it. And it's frustrating how they've extended it, extended it, extended it. We need to get this done, and we need to do it on a long term basis. Because if you're a contractor, you need to be able to play at it. It takes years to build a road or a bridge. Five years of, um, it was a five year plan. The Senate only wanted a two year renewal. And so they've been going back and forth with that. And, um, they haven't come up to an agreement yet. I'm not on the transportation committee, but I'm watching that because it's very, very important. And you're right. It's it's a jobs. It, it creates jobs. Plus, important for public safety. It makes sense. So the government's going to have to spend money for that, though. Yeah. You're aware of that, right? Yes. I mean, yes. Money. It would be right. hard money again, but it should be able to come back. Yeah. If it well, we like agree on job. that. I mean, like I said, I, I think, think that's a legitimate use of our tax dollars. Sure. The, the, your second question about taxing the, the imports that come in. Right. Uh, I, I've looked at that, talked to people about that. Part of the, the problem is when we start doing that, then other countries start blocking our imports. For instance, with China, even though I am not a fan of China, as you picked up, but a few years back, I believe it was steel that we tried to, you know, put an import tax on or, or make, because they were hurting our steel industry. Well, they retaliated by stopping some of our agriculture products. It was either pork or beef, I don't remember which one. I wasn't in Congress then, but uh, the problem is it hurt our farmers. So you begin trade wars once you do that. So I think the preferred method is what I'm supportive of, and that's free trade, like we just passed three trade agreements this year with President Obama's support, uh, bipartisanship support, with South Korea, uh, Panama, and Colombia. What those do is reduce the barriers for our products. Because I believe our companies, our small businesses, our farmers can compete with anybody in the world if we're given a level playing field. And the problem is we haven't had a level playing field. They've been able to enter our country, uh, low tariffs or no tariffs, and yet they have taxed us going in. So that's not fair. So I'm really glad uh, President Obama put forward the free trade agreements and we got those passed because it makes sense and it's going to immediately help increase our, our jobs in America. They were saying these three trade agreements alone would create 250,000 jobs at no <coughs> cost to the taxpayer. So that's a win-win and uh, there's other trade agreements being talked about with other countries and I think we got to do that and just fight for our own companies, fight for our own workers and make sure we have a level playing field. Well, what major defect with that, ma'am? I don't want to have the same standard of living that they have in China. So that's what we're headed to if we go that route. You know, we all love it here, and that's why everybody wants to come here. But if we keep doing that, we're going to be looking at everybody living in the hut, so on and so forth, and us not having the same life expectancy like a lot of us seniors do in this room. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody has an answer one yet? Yes. I have two questions. Are you running for a second term? And who is your choice to replace Clary McCaskill? <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the question, but this isn't a political or campaign uh, uh, meeting. This is an official meeting, so maybe you could come to a, a, a later event uh, that we might have or visit with you later or call me. I'd be happy to visit with you, but not in this forum. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I would like to ask about uh, for government to work, there needs to be transparency. We need to know what they're doing with our money. The government doesn't have any of its own money. We need to know what they're doing. And that requires a budget. And 
There hasn't been a budget in Washington for like three years, I think, something like that. And there is um, there is a push for this. Uh, it's called no budget, no pay, and uh, it's been criticized as saying, well, that's disrespectful to the people that are doing their work up there, but they're not doing, doing their, their work, work. Yeah. If, if they're not letting us know. And so the no budget, no pay uh, is, uh, I think, a good first step for accountability for Congress to, to let us know where our money is going, and then we can see what to do. That's a good first step, but what do you think? Yeah, I, I would support that. The House, we've been passing the budgets over, but the Senate, it's been over 1,060, 70 some days now since they've passed a budget, over three years since they've passed a budget on their House. So, like I said, it's been frustrating. Uh, when I was in the Missouri House uh, working for you in Jefferson City, we would do that because the Constitution said we were supposed to pass a budget by the second Friday in May. So the House would pass a version, then the Senate would pass their version, they would go to conference, and then you hammer out the differences or come to a compromise or whatever to work it out. But then we voted on it and got it done because it was in the Constitution. And so to see uh, some of the arrogance in the Senate, how they just ignore the Constitution, and we're not going to vote on a budget, we're not going to pass one, is, is been uh, frustrating to say the least. So I think maybe that would get their attention, and uh, you know I would support that. You know, because that's the job of Congress, is to do it. And uh, it's, it's frustrating that especially the Senate isn't doing the work. So, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'd like to come back to this gentleman's question about the Ryan budget. Uh, and he brought us some good points that you kind of skipped over, and then you started treating him like a political rival instead of a constituent and a veteran. And I think he deserved more respect than that. Yeah. Thank you. So, One, the Paul Ryan budget had a lot of tax cuts, 4.6 trillion by some estimates, uh, and those are not paid for, unless you can tell me how they're paid for. So that's going to make the deficit worse right off. And the second, he brought up Medicare, which you want to turn for people who are 55 and under into a, a coupon program where they've got to take that coupon and go into the private market and, and hope that, that can cover their costs, and then the rest comes out of their pocket. Again. Can you answer those two points, please? Sure. Uh, uh, try to. Uh, we'll start with the, the Medicare uh, question. First of all, it's one solution that I put forward, uh, that several in the House have put forward, and I said I'm open to other options as well. So if you have a better idea of how to save Medicare, preserve and protect it, I, I'm serious, you know, be happy to listen to it. But it's a very, very vital program. And we can't let it go bankrupt in eight years like Part A, like CBO says it's supposed to do. Uh, the, but you're a little, well, the, what, what it does is that 55 and younger would have the opportunity to participate in the federal health care plan. The federal health care program is one of the largest health care programs in the country, and it is very popular. Uh, all federal workers are part of this health care plan. And so it, it works, and it would be a way for seniors to access quality health care. Uh, they would be given a book of all the different health care options that are in the plan, and they could pick out the one they want. They could pick out one, the kind of bare bones plan, and the federal government pays the, most all the premium for them. If they want to pick a Cadillac plan as all the bells and whistles, they could, but they would have to pay more premium themselves. But it would be one solution to make sure that they access quality, affordable health care, uh, and it would also help so it doesn't cost so much uh, for the government. So I think it's a, a vital solution to put on the table said I'm willing to have other um, other solutions put forward as well. Um, and what was the other? 4.6 trillion in tax cuts on the Ryan budget. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Worse. Well, that is is partly projecting that that is going to stimulate growth. Uh, if you visit with a business owner now, and many small business owners pay their taxes through their individual income uh, return, if they're having to pay say 30 to 50 percent of their income in federal, state, local taxes, that doesn't leave them much money to invest in their business and to hire people and grow their business. And we've got all uh, so many people out of work, they need to get to work. And uh, many experts project that if the job creators are able to invest their money in their business rather than give it to government, 
then that will create and get more people working, which will uh, will help create the jobs. So, so it, right? it, it's trickled down economics. Yes. But is, is the 4.6 trillion paid for? Is it revenue neutral on the tax side? You I vote for it, you don't know though. Yeah, I, I believe it is paid for, but let's move but with on. What? Let's move with on. what? With what? Yeah. Uh, this lady here uh, mentioned something about uh, transparency. Uh, I think uh, my, what might help with, uh, with Medicare and uh, keeping the cost of uh, the medical coverage down for Medicare and, and private insurers would be more transparency in the medical uh, I, I've tried to uh, uh, research around how much certain procedures are going to cost. Um, and it's impossible to find out. Even if you have, even if you have the codes, uh, that they're going to use, uh, they hide behind this contract thing. And I think uh, one of the things that the, 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 the we need to have is how much is this going to cost me? Is it going to be a thousand dollars? Is it going to be fifteen thousand? And and right now, uh, uh, I called Social Security office. They said they could tell me that because I had an advance plan. They couldn't tell me I'd have to go through the advance period. Advanced carriers that we won't know until we send them through the billing. So I would make the suggestion that, uh, that you can promote transparency within the within medical profession, similar to what uh, was occurred. I, I agree with that, Dallas. In fact, I've talked about that off and on for a couple of years because it is, you're right, you go into the doctor and you don't know what the costs are. Um, I think it would help provide some competition at lower cost if people knew more. I mean, I call it the dollar menu theory. You know, I think it was McDonald's may have started off the first dollar menu, and then pretty soon, well, here's Burger King, and then Hardee's, and everybody has a dollar menu because the competition, you know how much it's going to be. You go to the doctor, you have no idea what that, uh, any of the procedures are going to cost, and you can't even compare. So if you went to this doctor versus this doctor, you don't know. And then, like you raised the point, it depends on the sometimes the insurance plan you're on too, and that doesn't seem quite fair either. So if you're it costs this, if you have an insurance plan, if you pay cash, it's this. Shouldn't it be the same for everybody? And shouldn't you have the right to know what that is so you can compare? So I think you've you've got a very good very good point there. So appreciate it. Uh, from your perspective in Washington, it seems like uh, in 2008, uh, Democrats uh, the Democrats took full control of the executive in both sides of the Congress. Uh, America wasn't too happy with that in 2010 and just kind of across the board, you know, just went the other way. My question is, do you get kind of sense that we're in a country where it's either you're in control of both branches of Congress, you know, whether you know, the executive would be nice, but where it's going to get anything done, it's going to take one party being in control of both chambers of Congress, or on the other one, nothing gets done. I guess the argument, my question is, if something doesn't change in the next election where either one party or the other has control of both, we just stagnate. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, you know, because everybody should be working for the people. Uh, we have been able to get some bipartisan things done, such as the trade trade bills. Uh, they were good, and there was a couple pieces of the uh, Affordable Care Act that were very onerous and, and we were able to repeal that and the president supported that and, and the Democrats supported it. So I'd be happy to, you know, reach across the aisle and work together on solutions. That's the right thing. I think we can look for areas of agreement. These 28 jobs bills that we passed, most of them had, I, I think almost all of them had bipartisan support in the House. And, you know, just the system needs to work. Uh, whereas the Senate is supposed to at least vote on it and then it's supposed to go to committee and then you can compromise or work out an agreement and say, okay, I'll support this or not. And that's what is not happening. These bills go over to the Senate and they don't even vote on it. So there's no opportunity to get together and compromise or meet in conference on it. And so I'm hopeful that whoever the leader is, whether it's Harry Reid or Mitch McConnell, whatever, after next election, that they will be willing to work with the House and at least pass a bill or amend it or change it and then we get to conference and so we can get things done because that's certainly what the american people deserve so thank you uh thank you guys for coming it's an honor to serve you